world of cooking content is ever encompassing and is one of the largest sections of content on this platform. You got your recipes and instructional videos, you got your TV style shows, you got reviews, you got eat with me, you got eat along, you got your edible gold, caviar and truffles. And well, of course, you have your mukbangs, children's content, obscure inedible recipes and more garbage. I'm burning too many calories. Oh, I'm already sweating and we haven't even eaten this yet. Good. Seemingly, YouTube food content is spreading into other niches too, be it vlogging or challenges and now this channel too. Welcome aboard, I am Anna and in this video we will review YouTube food content and we'll see how it desperately tries to isolate itself from its political background. Oh wait, why don't we all just want to keep politics out of our plate? Anytime you see food creators poke in direction of politics like Adam Ragusea sometimes does, for example, comment section seemingly explodes with comments that call to abandon politics and simply enjoy our meal. But the question here is bigger. It's not if we can isolate politics from food, but if we can isolate food from politics. And the answer is we can try. Mukbangs are perhaps one of the most apolitical content that you can find on this platform. Or at least it seems so if you watch mukbangs, which I dare you to not do. I already sacrificed my mental health for research for this video. You don't have to struggle the same fate. Here is a selection of beautiful Asian ladies which are eating live shellfish for no logical reason whatsoever. You may think that this is weird, but rules of the internet imply that somebody is to this. Please don't click away, we're only warming up. Mukbangs seemingly have everything you can wish for in the content. There is drama, there is pure entertainment, there is laughs, there is joy and copious amounts of food, of course. But above all, mukbangs provide something different. The interpersonal connection, like no other. Welcome back to my channel, my name is Stephanie and today we are back with another dun dun mukbang! Woo! Eating postulates a ritual. Eating is a practice that is strongly socially controlled. We eat with people we love. We eat with people we care about. We eat with people who we deem to be important. Eating rituals can also be abusive and restrictive. We can be denied place at the table. We can be denied particular ingredients due to our social status. Or we can be denied invitation to the party where food will be shared among people. Eating rituals are associated with how, what, and when we eat. The rituals are shaped by our society, by our culture, by time and place we are born and much, much more. Your actual lunch rituals are shaped by industrial revolution. In 17th and 18th century, as more people were moving into cities to work at plants, in mines and in factories for extended hours, people were not able to return home for their meal anymore. This change in the work environment, which was largely shaped by development of industrial capitalism, did lead us to create a lunch. Back then, we started to eat at least one of our meals in group of our co-workers, strangers or completely alone. We also developed a need for a meal that can be transported easily, packed at home or sold on the street. This is how sandwiches traveled from being a party food to being a handheld lunch food that we currently know. This change in the work environment that was largely shaped by development of industrial capitalism changed our food rituals, it changed how we eat. Mukbangs, despite being presented to us as a form of shock entertainment, actually have a very ritualistic setup. In South Korea, where our mukbangs originate, eating alone is a form of rebellion over ritualistic tradition of eating in a very structured group. But rebellion over tradition also means that eating alone carries a particular social stigma. And well, if you are eating alone in digital age, why won't you share your company with a stranger on the internet? Practice of eating alone becomes a form of a ritual of late capitalism. We now spend more time alone than ever. We frequently change workplaces, we live far from our families and we work far from our households. In the world where any form of social unit is increasingly pricey and hard to maintain, 
we share our meals with online strangers. Mukbangs exist on YouTube platform as completely apolitical content, or at least it seems so. But the context in which mukbangs became popular is nothing but politics. Mukbang origin is in denial of tradition, but popularity of mukbangs is determined by the world of screens, by the world of isolation and COVID lockdowns. It is a world shaped by pandemics, solitude and loneliness, in which creators are presented to us as lonely as their viewers. But there is more to mukbangs. There is also Mr. Bestification of content. Content featuring caviar, like Gubi for truffles, is not uncommon on this platform. And well, I understand that it can be quite fun. I do watch a lot of cooking content. I like to cook and follow plenty of creators on this platform. I do think that watching Sola and Priya shovel caviar into gingerbread mansion is fun to watch. But the issue with food content on this platform and largely across the internet remains the same. We showcast the best, the freshest, the most expensive ingredients. There is no space for your cheap as garbage food on this platform. You can take that Velveeta brick and shovel it down the trash can. As the spirit of Mr. Beast is haunting this platform, we showcast the most expensive, time-consuming and unaffordable recipes. Recipes often incorporate ingredients which are, first of all, unnecessary, but also expensive and hard to obtain. Food content becomes a stage in which creators are competing with who of them can create the biggest, the most expensive, most elaborate and time-consuming recipe. Competition to become Mr. Beast of Cooktube yet remains running. Yet again, there is anything but context in cooking content. And well, I understand this is in part because not everything has to be presented as political, even though everything is. In case of cooking content, avoiding politics of food is a political decision in itself. Remaining apolitical means that you will appeal to a wider audience and is simply more profitable. Not every brand wants to build any association between their brand and political viewpoint of particular creator. And while of course I don't call for all the creators suddenly to start making more political content, at least some amount of context provided in some of the videos would be great. Our perception of food through content remains largely the same. We see luxurious ingredients, usually expensive ones, high quality ingredients. We see recipes that require skill, recipes that require extended quantities of time and effort. We see recipes that require multiple tools like that one. The problem is that this thing is 300 bucks and you don't really need it unless you cook a lot. And also, American family needs to spend about 70% of their income on groceries if they want to live according to the latest understanding of a healthy diet. Food content today becomes not just a form of entertainment or a form of instructional video that teaches you new techniques or how to cook particular recipes. Instead, it becomes a show of experience that you cannot afford. In America, it is estimated that 40 to 50 million people live in state of food insecurity. 30 millions go starving every single day, including one in six children. But don't you worry, they're going to repeal child labor laws so this one in six starving children can start pulling themselves by the bootstraps very, very soon. Cooking is by far the most time-consuming household chore. On average, women report cooking for roughly five hours every single week within the United States. But this number varies significantly depending on culture that you look at. One thing, though, remains constant. Cooking is a labor that is overwhelmingly placed on women's shoulders. As sun is setting and rising across the globe, women feed the world, unrecognized, uncompensated, and often denied food that they cook. Yet, this gender division is reversed, as always, when cooking becomes a job that pays money. Only 6-7% of top restaurants are run by women. So is this content still apolitical, or are we simply pretending that it is? Price tag of food content remains an issue in itself. 
In part due to general direction into realm of spectacle, we see plenty of ingredients which are expensive, but also we see recipes and ingredients which are presented as a trash food versus normal people's food or poor man's food versus normal people's food or any really reiteration of the same comparison. Cheap foods that you can buy in grocery store today include different sorts of beans, canned soups, instant noodles, rice, grains, bananas in part thanks to corporate destruction of Central America. People on tight budgets survive on two for one and similar deals that do not propose any affordable and healthy options at the same price as canned soup. In return, people who are affected by food insecurity then face diets which are high in fat, salt, sugar, and low in everything else, which further perpetrates cycle of endless poverty. Yet content that we watch rarely incorporates poor man's food. Ingredients which are cheap or overprocessed are often deemed to be undesirable food for undesirable people. Or on opposite end, we see recipes that incorporate cheap food, but make something completely inedible out of it. Please, if we can stop placing bricks of cheese into things, our grandkids will be disgusted at it just as we're disgusted at aspic salads. In the world of today, hunger and food insecurity are rising for the first time in decades. In the world of prosperity and excess, we would rather allow our food rot in a landfill than give it for free to starving children. Hunger seems to be a ghost of our past. Actually, there is a type of content on YouTube that is highlighting poverty and food links and does it fairly well and it is historical cooking channels. Channels like Townsend or Max Miller or Emily Maid do a fairly good job highlighting recipes which are connected to poverty and highlighting social context in which food was created. There is still an issue though. We deem history a thing of the past, something that we had already overcome. We do not understand that we now too live in historical moment. Maybe 60 to 70 years from now, somebody will write their PhD about food insecurity in 21st century. Maybe they will even use this video as a reference material. We live in history. Poor man's food is not a thing of the past. It is also a thing of the present. How we are presented poor man's food sometimes is also an issue. We think of perhaps uh, McDonald's or Burger King or Chipotle as a poor man's affordable food. But in reality, it is not. Taking food out is not cheap. Yet we were sold the idea of fast food as being cheap and affordable option. People like Trump or Warren Buffett can sometimes be seen or presented as enjoying McDonald's burger or Coca-Cola, seemingly staples of American poor man's food. But this is a corporate idea of cheap food. Actual poor man's food in America is tuna mac or beanie weenie stew or peanut noodles or casseroles and much, much more. You can surely say that Trump knows what big tasty tastes like, but you can also know that his mom never cooked him a casserole with a canned soup as a star ingredient. 50 years from now, somebody will cook tuna mac as a form of entertainment to say, hey, 50 years ago, people used to eat this because they were so poor. Here for you today, I'm cooking a soup that is called zatirka or zatiruha, depending on the particular language that you prefer. It is common in Eastern Europe. It is also somewhat common in Middle East. My generation associates this soup with school lunches and kindergartens. It is also associated with fall of USSR, period right before and after collapse of USSR. But the origin of the dish goes further away into Russian surf system. Origin of the dish comes from using scrap bits from kneading and baking. Perhaps it was originally the way kitchen workers collected scraps to create a meal for their own family at the end of the day. Translation of the name of the soup comes from the word rub, which is what I'm doing. You dip your hands into mixed egg and you dip them in the flour and then you rub them together and those little bits that fall off your hands then become a form of a little egg pasta. 
The soup is very cheap, especially if you replace eggs with water. It also uses shelf-stable ingredients and really doesn't require any optional parts such as spices or lemon or chili pepper. And today somebody will cook the soup, not as a form of content and not as a form of entertainment, but as a way to stretch their pennies, as a way to create dinner out of seemingly nothing. In the world of food entertainment that is presented to us through fake kitchen setups, switch out dishes and fake recipes, we see that hunger and poverty are not really something that does exist anymore. Yet, in the world today, hunger and famine are a real thing. In Nunavut, about 50 to 70 percent of people live in the state of food insecurity. Children in America accumulate lunch debt, while their counterparts in more disturbed parts of the world actually outright starve. And of course, I do not expect food creators to start making more political content. That would simply mean that they are making a different content. But rather, what I want is for us to understand that food that we see as presented to us as entertainment is not reflective of the context of the world in which we live. We see others that eat like the rich. We want to eat like the rich, but we won't. Thank you for joining me today and watching this video and thank you to everybody who voted in the poll. Um, I know that you maybe expected magbang, but my stomach is actually made for pigeon-sized portions. So instead I showed you some horrible footage of magbang, so hopefully that was satisfactory. Special thank you to Chris who seeded this idea in my brain. And actually my interest in cooking, politics and reading books overlaps and I do collect books which are either niche cooking books or an intersection on food and politics like this one, Black Food, which is great dive into soul food and also has political essays in it. So if you have any recommendations of books and cooking books or niche cooking books which impressed you in the past, feel free to drop your recommendations recommendations in the comments because I will actually add them to a wish list and get them later. Well anyway, thank you for watching and see you on the next book. And you know, if anyone ever tells you that having a cooking channel is a good and entertaining idea, don't trust them. It's kind of hard and it takes extreme amount of time and it's been taking like whole Sunday. So. If you appreciate the effort, please subscribe.